Welcome to our local history talk this month, The Persistence of Indigenous Enslavement in Dutch and English New York and New Jersey by Linford Fisher. The lecture is one of many collaborations in 2022 between the library and the Jacob Leisler Institute. Each features a different expert on early colonial history. I'm here with the library director, Emily Shemitis, who will be putting links in the chat box and helping to facilitate during the Q&A that we'll have after the lecture. The Hudson Area Library does have a history room that's dedicated to preserving and making accessible the history of our library service areas, which are Hudson, Greenport, and Stockport. And the history room is open on Saturdays from 10 in the morning to 1 p.m. and also by appointment for any type of local research. Um, and there's also online research requests that are at our um, History Room website. And Emily's gonna put that in the link. There's a lot of information on that website. There's a lot of images. There's a lot of texts, including full city of Hudson directories from 1851 on that you can actually search through. So please do visit that website. Um, the research request, if you fill it out, it's a free service that we offer as a library. Each year we do several programs with the Jacob Leisler Institute for the Study of Early New York History. They are an independent, not-for-profit study and research center devoted to collecting, preserving, and disseminating information relating to colonial New York under English rule. We're very grateful for this partnership and to be working with Dr. David Voorhees, the director of the Institute, which is headquartered here in Hudson. David is also the managing editor of the, the Havaman, The Half Moon, a quarterly scholarly journal published by the Holland Society of New York. An NYU research scientist, he's a former managing reference history editor at Charles Scribner's Sons and has published numerous historical works and articles and been a consultant on historical exhibitions at the Museum of the City of New York and the Bard Graduate Center in Manhattan, among others. So uh, David will now introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you, Brenda. It is with deep gratitude to again be thanking the Hudson Area Library for hosting the Jacob Leisler Institute's lecture series. This series is made possible through the generous support of the Van Dyke Family Foundation and the Hudson River Bank and Trust Foundation. It is with pleasure that I introduce tonight's speaker, Linford Fisher. Dr. Fisher is an associate professor of history at Brown University and the principal investigator of the digital project, Stolen Relations, Recovering Stories of Indigenous enslavement in the Americas. Stolen Relations is a community-centered, collaborative endeavor that seeks to broaden our understanding of the indigenous experiences of settler colonialism and its legacy through the lens of slavery and servitude. Dr. Fisher is the author of The Indian Great Awakening, Religion and the Shaping of Native Cultures in Early America, co-author of Decoding Roger Williams, The Lost Essay of Rhode Island's Founding Father, as well as author of numerous articles and essays on a diverse array of hot topics. He is currently finishing a book-length project on Native American enslavement in the English colonies of North America and the Caribbean, and later in the United States. Dr. Fisher, the screen is yours. Good evening, everyone. I'm assuming you're gonna hear me unless uh, you wave your hand frantically otherwise. It's really nice to see you via Zoom. I'm sorry we're not in person, but such is the way of the world at the moment. Um, thank you, David, for that warm and kind introduction and to Brenda and Emily too for facilitating everything leading up to this uh, event here as well. So as Dennis mentioned, and as some background uh, in terms of my own academic and intellectual biography, I guess, um, I just want to highlight that I am working on two different projects that relate to this evening's talk. Um, as Dennis mentioned, first of all, I'm working on this book project um, that uh, is, has been 10 years in the making as these things go. Those of you who have labored in this way understand uh, how slow it can be sometimes. 
um, that looks at enslavement of natives in English speaking colonies over time, uh, but also into the US as well. Um, so the wider Caribbean, North America, but also the United States up to the American Civil War. And then secondly, I'm the principal investigator of this uh, really fascinating digital history project, Stolen Relations, uh, Recovering Stories of Indigenous Slavery in the Americas. And so I and a team at Brown University are working with 13 regional tribes in New England as we compile this database of individual natives caught up in enslavement over time. And the vision is hemispheric, although at the moment we're mostly focused on New England because of our collaborations. But we um, hope over time uh, to, to sort of expand this. And even now in the database, uh, we have instances of, of people from California as well as uh, the, the Caribbean, Central America, and so forth. Um, sadly, the project is not uh, yet public, but uh, we do have this experimental search that we're working with our uh, tribal um, partners on to sort of understand how to present things in a sensitive and historically relevant way. Um, so this won't be how it looks, you know, in a year or so when it's made public, but this is just for our own purposes, sort of on the back end to work out some kinks and so forth. But you'll see uh, in the location box here, just as an example, I've typed in New Jersey and several pages of results came out of enslavers and enslaved people that were um, a part of, of this time period that we're talking about here. Um, so I'd be happy to say more during the Q&A if this interests people, um, but I just wanted to put this on your radar maybe as a sort of pre-announcement and say that this talk is, is drawn from both my book research and the Stolen Relations Project. And I also just want to recognize too that um, as many of you probably know as well, that these collaborations with these uh, tribes and communities have really reinforced something that I think scholars and the wider public always need to be reminded of, which is to say that um, this is not just the past. This is not just history. Um, this is a living present for many and, and all, really, uh, indigenous nations and individuals who um, are still living with the ramifications of these kinds of events, um, the historical trauma and the loss and the way that their lives are structured today um, all reflect these ongoing uh, colonialisms that they experience today. So in the brief time we have this evening, I wanna make sure that several points come through loud and clear, just as sort of a summary in a way, um, relating to the larger history of enslavements uh, in the Atlantic world, and specifically indigenous enslavement, and then zooming down in more specifically to New Jersey and New York. And so um, first of all, to think about this in the bigger picture, um, indigenous slavery, and this is something that I hope comes through, in this talk uh, was much more prevalent than we've previously realized. And thinking hemispherically, scholars now estimate that between two and 5.5 million natives were enslaved in the Americas between 1492 and roughly 1880, compared with 10 to 12.5 million enslaved Africans that were brought over from Africa in the same time period. And uh, so it started earlier than we might imagine, I'll look at two in a minute, and it lasts longer than we often realize as well. And of course, this uh, is part of the history of New Jersey and New York, uh, which I'll focus on in just a minute. Secondly, that these histories of indigenous slavery and African slavery are interrelated in different kinds of ways. Um, and it's, it's really uh, almost every colony has its own sort of version of this interrelated list relatedness. And in some ways that interrelatedness comes from thinking about sort of what's happening, you know, in North America with sort of Caribbean and the wider transatlantic African slave trade. But part of it is thinking about the ways in which Indians and Africans or Native Americans and Africans labored on plantations side by side and household were clumped together in colonial laws, as I'll mention in just a little bit as well. Um, so to even though this for the most part, this talk focuses more on indigenous enslavements. Um, I'm surely aware, and I'll make references in this direction too, there's many points of, of interchange. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to make uh, Dennis Micah's uh, talk, um, but it sounds like uh, there was a lot of rich sort of uh, background on slavery um, in the Dutch period as well, um, given, and, and these things uh, come together in really specific ways. Thirdly though, um, the, the ongoing nature of indigenous enslavement, I think this is one of my background arguments here too, 
I think in some locales forced us to rethink the foundation of colonization. Uh, so it wasn't just that slavery, you know, all of a sudden appeared in 1619 in Virginia and it affected forcibly and imported Africans, but it was actually something that was imposed on natives and threatened to natives from the very first moment of contact. Um, and it persisted even past the American Civil War, as I'll talk about at the very, very end of this talk, if I get that far. Um, so, and indigenous slavery was much more central to how Europeans thought about controlling indigenous people as well, um, where there was warfare and local indigenous peoples were rounded up and shipped off. Uh, that was a part of clearing the land and allowing for colonial settlement, right? And that's slightly different than uh, the way that Africans were used because Africans, uh, you know, weren't indigenous to this land, obviously. So enslaving natives does the dual work of providing labor and clearing the land. So there's this ideological sort of settler colonial component to this that I think is really important. Maybe not quite so prevalent in New York and New Jersey, but certainly in other parts of, of the continent. So with that, I wanna just touch briefly on the indigenous background to enslavement. This is something that uh, always comes up when I give talks, different places, people always, always say, well, didn't Native Americans enslave each other as well? And so I just wanna sort of preemptively, maybe in a way, talk about this for a second. Um, it certainly is the case that indigenous people fought each other, they, they captured uh, each other and they coerced the bodily labor of other people and tribes prior to the coming of Europeans. Um, there's evidence from different amazing sites around North America, Central America and South America, um, evidence of coerced labor to produce some of the pretty amazing architectural feats in the region, whether it's at Chaco Canyon here um, or in uh, Cahokia, which is just an artist rendering here um, of the mound, the central mound um, and the surrounding sort of villages and towns. Um, so, you know, there's a, a way in which we could say, yes, that seems to be the case, but there's sort of a deeper debate here as well, which is how do we define captivity that happens between different, different native tribes and entities. Um, so the field has sort of talked about this in terms of capture and replacement so that these mourning wars, like those undertaken by the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois the Six Nations, uh, scholars have pointed to the fact that captive taking in those contexts was more to replace family members that had been lost. But other scholars have also argued that uh, indeed there was more coercion in those uh, captivity and replacement kinds of practices that might have mirrored something more like chattel slavery in that the individual autonomy of people was completely um, coerced and, and controlled um, by, by essentially the masters. So more interesting to me, I think, rather than sort of try to solve these debates of whether or not Native Americans did or didn't practice slavery, as we might refer to it, more interesting to me is this question of how does the arrival of Europeans change these practices? And I think that that is really uh, the most relevant question in a way, because it's uh, undeniable that there's a fundamental reorientation about the practice of, of taking captives or of enslaving people um, in terms of specifically turning them into sort of like capitalist and industrial pursuits uh, and doing it on a much, much larger scale and thinking about uh, lifelongness and heritability and things that might have not factored in quite so, so commonly. Um, and then you introduce idea of only certain races of people and classes of people should be enslaved. And I think that the, the situation looks much different by 1700, 1800, whatever. So with that in mind, I wanna just give a very brief history and I promise we'll get to New York, New Jersey in a minute. Uh, give a very brief history just to think about where slavery emerges from on the European side in the early modern period. And I like to think of it as emerging in three different phases in a way. Um, so the first pre-1492, this uh, captivity and slavery of various sorts that are common in the Mediterranean world, uh, sometimes emanating out of the Black Sea, the scholars have written about um, in North Africa, drawing in different geographies in the surrounding Mediterranean basin. Um, very common in different kinds of ways, also persists up into the 16th, 17th century in different kinds of ways as well. Um, so nothing super unique about it, uh, but it, it does um, sort of affect a variety of different kinds of peoples, um, even as there are some people groups sometimes that are more targeted than others. But a second phase is introduced in the early 1400s and mid 1400s 
when Europeans, especially the Portuguese, began enslaving West Africans uh, in larger numbers and specifically taking voyages down the African coast uh, to conduct this kind of trade and enslavement. Um, and initially, these enslaved Africans, yes, were shipped to different parts of Europe, but also used to work plantations in what we call the near Atlantic islands, uh, so the Canaries, the Azores, uh, Cape Verde islands, and so forth. And uh, so by the uh, you know, by 1492, tens of thousands of enslaved Africans uh, had been transshipped to different parts of, of Europe and, and parts of the near Atlantic here. So then the third phase really is in 1492, and this is most relevant to the talk today. Again, thinking big picture here for a moment, um, a new era of slavery was inaugurated, namely Native American enslavements. Uh, so, of course, Columbus and his three ships land on Guanahani, which is now San Salvador and the Bahamas. And from that very first voyage, uh, began to see Native Americans through the lens of African slavery and African enslavement practices. Columbus had been down the west coast of Africa. He saw this early African slave trade and envisioned something similar for what he thought really actually were Asians. But um, anyway, he called them Indians and, and wanted to routinely and regularly ship back these Indians, as he called them, to Europe to finance the colonization of these areas. Um, this was actually turned down by the queen uh, and the king and queen, but it didn't uh, prevent him from um, shipping back hundreds of enslaved natives, of native captives for sale as slaves um, during his, his voyages to, to the Americas. And so this inaugurates uh, and as I say here, um, Columbus, I think, can rightfully be called uh, the first Indian enslaver, right? So he proposes this as a commercial enterprise. Um, and this leads to, as we know, right, uh, the Black legend is strong in a way. We know that the Spanish um, and the Portuguese, uh, through their enslavement practices, through working indigenous peoples in the mines, which is what is pictured here in this picture in the bottom right, um, led to the decimation of, of the population of the um, Caribbean largely, but also por portions of Central America and South America as well, right? Um, and the population of Hispaniola today, uh, not today, but back then was reduced from 3 million to about 11,000 uh, indigenous people just within, you know, um, several decades. So, but then in the, the, the 16th century, there's perhaps a million or more Africans and Indians that have been enslaved in the Americas. And on this point of indigenous slavery, scholars have, have begun, again, keeping this bigger picture in mind just for a moment, have begun to try to understand um, these centers of, of major Indian slave trading or indigenous slave trading in the Americas over time. So these don't happen all at once, uh, but there's different empires involved, the French are involved, the Dutch are involved, Spanish, English as well, um, in ways that in, in, in some moments parallel what's happening in Africa. And uh, there's much more that I could say about this, but just a place on your radar that even if we're talking about New Jersey and New York, there's this much wider world, a hemispheric world, of uh, Native American slave raiding, of slave trading, of trans and across the hemisphere. So I say all this just to remind us that, um, you know, Spain and Portugal had a full century of French and Dutch really come to the scene. So there's so much already in place uh, in terms of um, slave trading routes, commercial trading connections, long histories of violence against natives, land grabbing, Africans being used as slaves and so forth. And so when we talk about the Dutch arriving in North America in 1610, 1614, or the English in 1607 or 1620, we should remember that they're not operating in a vacuum. They're operating against the backdrop of this, um, you know, rich but also violent um, settler colonialism and different kinds of models that have been taking place around the Americas that they benefit from in some ways. And they get to chart their own path in that, but they also draw upon the experiences of the Spanish and the Portuguese and, and raid their ships and use the the bodies that the Spanish and Portuguese had captured, uh, whether in West Africa or in parts of the Americas as well. So turning then to English slavery, again, thinking more broadly before zooming in on New Jersey and, and New York, when we think about the English arriving, they're not strangers to slavery. 
there's a whole history here that we could talk about. In terms of 16th century English attempts to enter the transatlantic slave trade, um, they know what they're doing. They know how African slavery works. And uh, right away, they jump in also to indigenous slavery in different kinds of ways. Uh, and if you read these early travel counts of early adventurers and explorers, one thing that really stands out is at almost every instance, um, these adventurers and explorers kidnap and nab natives on the shores of rivers and, and gulfs and coasts and whatever else. Um, and sometimes they just use them as guides. Sometimes they take them back and try to convert them. Sometimes they try to learn the language and have them learn whether it's Dutch, English or French or whatever. But this kidnapping off the coast happened so often, so early uh, uh, by almost everyone, not just Columbus, but Verrazano, Henry Hudson, John Smith. And actually one of the biggest early episodes of English, not just sort of kidnapping, but actually slave raiding takes place in 1614. Famously, Captain Thomas Hunt, who is associated with John Smith, uh, and they're kind of exploring the coast of New England. This is where John Smith's famous map comes from of New England from this time period. Um, they actually, you know, set up a, they pretend to trade with local Wampanoags off of Cape Cod, but actually grab 24, 27 by some counts, load them on a ship, and Thomas Hunt takes them to Spain and sells them all as slaves in Spain. One of them is Santa Marsquanto. He makes his way back over time and is actually here in 1620, well, I say here in, in North America in 1620 um, as an intermediary between the pilgrims, so-called, uh, and local Wampanoag leaders. So this um, presence, English presence, well, let me say first that uh, some of you might have seen this, but um, a friend of mine, Paula Peters, who's Mashpee Wampanoag, has put together this really incredible exhibit to tell the story of Thomas Hunt and these early Wampanoag uh, people who who were enslaved by, by Thomas Hunt. It's called Our Story. It travels around. It can actually go to different places too uh, for a set fee. So if this interests um, anyone on this call, I encourage you to look into it. It's really moving and worthwhile. Uh, and most importantly, created and authored by uh, a descendant of the people that were directly affected, right? So, of course, just to sum up briefly then, in terms of slavery more generally, colonial wars lead to the enslavement of natives in larger numbers. Um, we could go into depth in each one of these, the Pequot War, the Powhatan Wars in Virginia, King Philip's War in New England. These all lead to the local enslavement and at times transshipment of hundreds of indigenous people um, out into the Caribbean um, over time. And also at the same time period, English colonists begin importing enslaved Africans as well. So Bermuda, 1616, Virginia famously, 1619, and then 1638, Massachusetts. Uh, the 1638 instance is fascinating because it actually involves the exchange of Pequot, enslaved Pequots on Providence Island, deep in the Spanish Caribbean, just off the coast of Nicaragua and Honduras today, um, where uh, a captain takes uh, 17 enslaved Pequots. He's supposed to go to Bermuda, but he misses and goes the whole way down to Providence Island, sells them to the Puritan colony down there, exchanges them in a, in a sense for Africans, bring them up to Boston and sells them in Boston in 1638. Okay, so finally, as promised, slavery in New York and New Jersey. Um, uh, this, I'm sure this is a very uh, a well-versed audience now. So um, in, in terms of slavery in this time period, uh, so I'll give a little bit of, of a big picture and get to, to some more specifics as well. So in terms of the Dutch periods, uh, as you, if you were here for the prior presentation, you probably heard African slavery really starts in some ways in 1622, although native captives uh, and, and, and kidnappings take place before then the hands of the Dutch as well. Um, 1636, the Dutch West India Company prohibits the enslavement of, of natives, um, importantly, I think, in a way, and famously as well. Um, it's unclear that this has any effect, and I would point out that this is actually something that I've increasingly um, come to sort of realize in my own scholarship and, and reading and writing, and many of you probably have the same sense, is that 
these laws, uh, when you read that a law is passed that says X, Y, or Z, I mean, two things should come to mind. First of all, if a law is passed against it, it means it was probably happening, right? But then second of all, if a law is passed against it, doesn't mean that it stopped happening when the law was passed. And so um, often I'm very skeptical of studies that point to a law prohibiting indigenous enslavement and say, look, it was illegal. And what I've seen is no one cares if it's illegal. They care if they get caught, but they still continue to do these things over and over and over again. Um, and indeed, we see this with the Dutch as well in different kinds of ways. I think there are several examples of this that we could point to uh, in the Dutch period in this region, um, two episodes of enslavement. Um, the first uh, was during the violent conflict between the Dutch and regional native nations in the early 1640s called Keefe's War um, after the Dutch governor, which resulted in, in taking natives from various tribes as captives and slaves, um, including the Munsees. And uh, during this war, enslaved indigenous people were also given to, or indigenous captives were given to soldiers as reward for fighting in the war too, which is really common for the English and the Dutch. Um, but one particular shipment of Indian captives was sent to Bermuda in September of 1644, with one unnamed native being reserved and sold to William Sale, the governor of Bermuda, on the authority of uh, Keefe himself, um, so the Dutch governor Keefe himself. And if you read this bill of sale, which is really fascinating, the particular sale, uh, this particular sale was for the term of four score and 19 years. So if you've got your uh, math proper uh, down properly, that's 99 years. And the term of uh, the terms of the bill of sale says that he sold as a servant for 99 years. If so long he shall live, it says. So this idea that the English sort of, you know, or the, the, the Dutch, the English both together in a way call this servitude, but it's uh, functional lifelong enslavement. And these terms actually are really common in Bermuda right in this time period in the 1640s. And I haven't quite figured out why. Um, I haven't seen it replicated in quite those same terms in other places, but if someone has a lead on that, please let me know. The second episode is uh, during the 1660s, the Esopus Wars, the second and third Dutch Muncie Wars, when the Dutch soldiers rounded up as many uh, Esopus men and children as they could and held them as captives. Um, and 10 of them were sent to Curacao, where they were uh, essentially exchanged for 10 Africans in instead. Um, and the records are very clear about this sort of uh, back and forth. So um, after the English takeover of um, New Netherlands in 1664, New York and New Jersey, of course, slowly enter the English orbit of things, even as, and I want to stress this, because I know this is important to the history of this region, even as these regions, these colonies retained important populations and enclaves of Dutch cultured inhabitants, which is no news to anyone on this call. Um, this meant in part that black slavery grew in these colonies um, from 2,500 slaves in New York in 1700 uh, to 30,000 by 1800 a century later. But as scholars have noticed, um, there's multiple sources for this increase in slavery. That is to say, both Dutch and English colonists contribute to this growth. And just as a fascinating little sidebar, one way of, of tracing the Dutch sources, some scholars have suggested, is by looking at Dutch-speaking slaves in the records, especially in runaway slave advertisements. And so scholars have estimated that somewhere between 16 and, and 40 is the highest number I've seen percent of such runaways were Dutch speaking in some fashion, uh, or maybe had some sort of Dutch, you know, identity or, or uh, familiarity in some way that you could identify them as sort of um, Dutch influence, uh, with the greatest concentration of them coming from the Hudson River Valley. And I should say, as I say here, parenthetically, I'm drawing in part on the work of a few academics, including Michael Doma, who may be uh, on this call here tonight as well. But it's important to note that there is there are actually uh, examples of Dutch speaking indigenous slaves in these runaway ads too, which I find immensely fascinating. So one of them is just one example, is that of an Indian girl named Grace, 
who ran away from a New York merchant named Nicholas Germain in 1707. And the advertisement notes that she speaks English, Dutch, and French at 17 years old. Very, very uh, impressive. And as an aside, this advertisement is a good illustration of the richness, uh, the biasness as well, but the richness of these sources um, still through the eyes of slaveholders, but but um, with a window into individual people that you might not get in other uh, sources. There are intimate details about physical features, um, what is likely smallpox scars, uh, minimal eyebrows, the shape of um, Grace's nose and mouth. And what's really fascinating for me in this advertisement as well is that um, you can see from the second half, I mean, it's, it's really over half the advertisement uh, that this, uh, this owner, Nicholas Germain, actually lists out the different kinds of people that you can sort of return grace to if you find her in this colony. If it's Massachusetts, return her to this person, Connecticut, this person, New Hampshire, this person which is a really interesting way of understanding sort of these otherwise invisible networks of slave catching and kind of, you know, guarding uh, property at some level uh, as viewed by the law anyway in this time period. So, um, you know, there's a lot of talk in the 19th century and even late 18th century about runaway slaves and, and fugitive slave laws and slave catchers and stuff like that. But we see this functionally in action really early here in 1707. Um, just after the advent of newspaper publishing starting in 1704. So immensely interesting in different ways. Another advertisement comes from 1771, much later in the 18th century when a mixed race, uh, Indian and, and black uh, man named uh, Simon ran away from Peter Lowe. And the advertisement gives a rich description of vocation, a chimney sweeper, but also clothing, old thick set coat, old blue watch coat, an old beaver hat, and uh, his chimney sweeping utensils. And the ad calls him, it's kind of fascinating, both Dutch and English, which I find intriguing in 1771 and speaks to the longevity of these simultaneous experiences, I think, in this area. I also find it fascinating personally, uh, just to look at the last third of the advertisement, the little finger pointing. Um, the Peter Lowe is like, well, I'm taking out an advertisement and paying for, you know, advertising for Simon to be returned. But while I'm at it, I might as well advertise my chocolate business. And so he has this paragraph. He's like, hey, if you want some chocolate, come to, you know, Maiden Lane to be close to Broadway and, and be a customer of mine. And if you're in the country, we got we got you supplied, too. I mean, it's this weird juxtaposition of, of, you know, an advertisement that is asking uh, for the return of, of a self-emancipated man uh, and, and also promoting his business simultaneously. Well, one of the strangest phenomena when it comes to indigenous enslavement is that we have very few records of how natives were enslaved. That is to say, the shipping records or the documentation of overland transshipment or local enslavement are sparse, um, unlike the African slave trade, which is well documented. And yet, so we have sparse documentation about how indigenous people are enslaved and how they're brought to different colonies. But at the same time, throughout the English period, we find dozens upon dozens of indigenous people listed in newspapers, probate records listed for sale sometimes, in different areas, I find them in correspondence and different kinds of records. So we know they're there, but we're, it's not always clear how they get there. I think that's one of the sort of question marks. And it's not just New York, New York and New Jersey. There's other places where this is also a kind of question too. And so I just wanted to think with you for a moment about this, um, because this is something I've been thinking a lot about in different areas. So um, there's several trends if you look not only New York, New Jersey, but also the English colonies more generally, uh, you see certain trends that really stand out just so very, very quickly. The first that there is privateering networks in the Caribbean, uh, as I sort of hinted at before, where English ships go down and they essentially take over, privateers take over um, the commandeer Spanish and Portuguese and sometimes Dutch ships as well take uh, wh whoever is enslaved on the ship and bring them back to a port and sell them as slaves, right? So this um, 
semi-legal uh, privateering network, um, you know, usually uh, done during times of war, but also other times as well, um, leads to a slow trickle of enslaved Native Americans and Africans in all parts of the English empire, including New York and New Jersey. The second one is enslavement through warfare. Um, just war theory was really a large part of justifying this. Um, there aren't the same kinds of wars necessarily against natives uh, in New York and New Jersey, but New York and New Jersey benefit from um, the flow of captives from Virginia, from the Carolinas, from New England, for example, into New York and New Jersey as well. The third is there's large scale Indian slave trades, which I hinted at earlier with that map. Um, within the English empire, there's two main ones, the, the Carolinas between 1680 and 1720, between 25 and 51,000 natives were enslaved, uh, the Mosquito Shore, what's now Nicaragua uh, and, and Honduras, the Mosquito Indians were at the head of a, a, a vast um, slave raiding sort of indigenous empire that fed the English colonies uh, with uh, enslaved indigenous people for over 100 years um, in the 17th and 18th century as well. And so if you think about like the map, um, this map should have more lines going everywhere, but uh, indigenous people are, are being slave raided and, and captured in different parts of the English empire, the Caribbean, and then being brought up to New York, New, York, New Jersey, Boston, you know, Massachusetts, whatever, uh, Pennsylvania and other places as well. So this idea of larger scale Indian slave trades in the English empire as supplying these colonies is something that I think scholars haven't talked enough about, but it's certainly something that I'm trying to make clear in my book. Scholars talk a lot about the Carolina Indian slave trade, but not so much the Mosquito Shore. The fourth one here, judicial enslavement. This covers a whole range of ways in which the law was leveraged to keep people in unfree situations, especially indigenous people. Um, so to be enslaved as a, a result of committing crime, as a punishment, um, lots of examples of this, uh, to pay off a debt, um, that's pretty common as well, or court-ordered indenture as a way of taking away uh, indigenous children from their families, very, very common in certain places. The fifth one is bounties during wartime. Um, this was true in every war up through the American Revolution, that's uh, governments would place a bounty on either the scalps or else the alive bodies of indigenous people. And often those captives, uh, if they were brought in alive in any way, were um, sold off or sold out of the country or given as, as sort of war bounty in a way uh, over time as well. There are hints in the records of all of this, and I just want to linger on this for a little bit just to kind of illustrate how enslaved indigenous people might have come to New York and New Jersey. And uh, one um, consistent source that I've found over a variety of records is the ongoing sporadic importation of enslaved Indian men and women into New York and New Jersey over time and other places as well. Um, so most of these sporadic importations follow other kinds of merchant networks. So merchants who are out in the Caribbean doing other kinds of trade uh, might purchase or, or steal, pilfer enslaved indigenous people or indigenous people stuff them into their hold with other kinds of cargo, come to New York, you know, come to wherever, Boston, Charleston, and sell them along with the other merchandise that they had in their ship. Um, so it's just one example of this in the 1670s. Um, the New York legislature noted that there, were, there was a small slave trade into New York uh, and from the Spanish Caribbean, from Mexico and other foreign parts, as they say. So in response, on April 20th in 1680, the New York legislature passed a law that essentially outlawed all future enslavement of Indians. And they gave a, a grace period of six months for masters and owners to return enslaved Indians uh, or send them out of the, the colony. Uh, but after six months, all enslaved indigenous people were supposed to be free. Um, well, as I hinted at before, uh, that doesn't always uh, happen quite so easily. Uh, but the law is very clear, right? Resolve that Indians uh, uh, here, as supposed to say, excuse me, have always been and are free and not slave nor forced to be servants. Uh, but then just a few months later in the records, we have James Barr who imports and offloads and sells 13 Indians upstate, uh, excuse me, in New York, New York City, 
uh, that he had seemingly pilfered, stolen, or purchased from the Spanish Caribbean. They all have Spanish sounding names, which is, is why I say that. And in fact, James Barr gives one to his wife, one enslaved Indian to his wife, and gives one enslaved indigenous person to his mother-in-law as well. Uh, there's also other kinds of hints from the records of other uh, origins as well. So um, when you see Spanish, sometimes French indigenous people in these self-emancipated or runaway slave ads, um, you have a good sense that there's transshipment and movement, uh, forced movement of people taking place in this time period. There's other hints too of, of mechanisms of enslavement in different ways. Um, so there's some moving stories, uh, one of which is this Shinnecock single uh, woman mother named Nancy, who in 1755 bound, signed a document that would bind her uh, 18 month old son to a local colonist named Elisha Osborne of, of East Hampton, New York for 15 years starting at the age of six. So her son was 18 years, uh, 18 months old. She signs a document that says when he turns six, he's yours for 15 years. Uh, 15 years was a long indenture um, and the age of six was pretty young in some ways. Um, so Nancy must have had uh, circumstances that were somewhat desperate. So this all sounds normal and not like slavery, right? But we know of other situations um, where indenture turned into slavery in different kinds of ways. Sometimes uh, masters could traffic uh, indentured um, natives across colony lines and sell them as slaves or add on to their years for infractions or debt that was racked up or something like that or crimes that they had in, uh, were accused of doing. And in fact, there's an instance of native parents in New York in the 18th century complaining to local officials that their indentured children had been, quote, transferred to other plantations and sold for slaves, end quote. So this is a, a real problem that, that indigenous parents find themselves having to complain against, complain about. And that phenomenon helps, under, helps us understand this advertisement from 1802, where an, uh, an unfree girl, they call her a woman named Dolly, who's 18 years old, um, who is multi-race, uh, African and Indian, um, they say she disappeared, but when she came back, she said that she had been kidnapped by the person who bound her uh, and sold in the jerseys in New Jersey, right? Um, so this advertisement, the sort of master says, oh, this is just fake, it's a fabrication. But we have lots of other evidence where this easily could have, have been the case, uh, could have happened. But there's yet another way that indigenous children could have... Um, come into enslavement in a way, which I think is kind of heartbreaking. Um, so there's a, a pretty clear instance in 1750, the New York Governor Clinton hears about indigenous children being held as collateral for trade goods. So if you have English traders who are coming to whatever, trade with local indigenous populations for clothing or guns or whatever else they're allowed to trade, uh, and, uh, you know, it's either a cashless or a credit society. And if indigenous people don't have, you know, real money to, to give, um, the traders demanded children as collateral. And once the debt was paid, then the children would be returned. But what was happening is the children were not being returned. And they complained directly to the governor that their children had been sold into slavery out of the colony. And so the governor passes this sort of like, um, you know, executive order, basically, uh, ordering that all children who had been kept in that way be returned. But there's, you know, no enforcement, no mechanism for this um, at all. So another way to sort of judge indigenous presence is that the laws by the 18th century in New, New York and New Jersey um, all reference this common triad of Negro, Indian, and mulatto slaves. And so we see this in 1713 and 1768 in New Jersey. We see this in a controversy over baptism that erupts in the 16, uh, starts in the 1670s and then um, is sort of uh, not finalized, but the law is very clear in 1706 that basically says outright that, that no enslaved person will be free by receiving baptism, right? That they can be baptized and be a Christian, but they will still retain their status as slaves. And the law clearly says Negro, Indian, or mulatto slave. 
uh, which um, we see repeatedly over time too. One interesting piece of this, the 1706 proclamation, actually affirms what scholars call partis sequitur ventrum, which is a Latin phrase that means the condition of the, the mother who followed the child. And uh, English colonies adopt this sort of uh, piecemeal over time, um, but it really is a way of ensuring multi-generational perpetual slavery uh, that every child an enslaved woman has will also be enslaved no matter the parentage, even if the white father. Um, so you can see here again, Negro, Indy, Mulatto, and Mesty Bastard Child. So the, the sort of comprehensive covering of laws, even into the 18th century, cover uh, Indian slaves as well. What's really important to note, though, is this principle of, of part of sequitur ventrum actually cuts both ways. So it was intended by slave owners to keep the children of Black women in slavery. But actually, Native Americans turned it on its head and used it to sue for their freedom. So the logic is if, if the condition of the mother follows a child, well, if the mother's free or if an earlier maternal ancestor was free, then that should mean that the child or the grandchild is also free. So that's exactly what you see starting in the 1770s uh, and even before this as well. Uh, there's a few cases in New England in the 1740s indigenous, enslaved indigenous people sue for their freedom based upon the fact that they have a free maternal ancestor using part of sector ventrum. One famous case is the case of Dinah Neville. Um, people talk about her because she, uh, her case uh, led to the founding of the Society for the Relief of Free Negroes Unlawfully hold, Held in Bondage, which is the first anti-slavery society in the, in the American colonies. Well, people don't realize that she was also indigenous. She's multi-race, she's African and Indian. And I won't go into her whole details here, but she basically uh, was sold into slavery by a New Jersey merchant. She petitions for her freedom in Philadelphia. Uh, initially, Pennsylvania courts judge her and her children to be slaves. It's appealed based upon a 1725 anti-Indian slavery law in Pennsylvania. And eventually she is bought by somebody else uh, and is freed. And there's this just astonishing, but deeply problematic um, painting that is done in this time period, um, 1795, later after a manumission depicting this. So Dinah is the, uh, of course, the, the one on her knee here, um, receiving manumission, uh, supposedly. What's interesting is not all colonies uh, saw uh, it freeing enslaved natives as something that should be done. And there's a really fascinating Supreme Court case in New Jersey involving an enslaved woman named Rose. Rose's mother had been enslaved in the Carolinas, probably during the Yamasee War in the 17-teens. Uh, she was enslaved. She bore Rose in 1740, who was also enslaved uh, following part of Cycle Preventrum, right? Uh, Rose to, for her freedom in the 1790s, 55 years later. Uh, but the New York Supreme Court denied her her freedom. And the question is, why is that? And in the, the ruling, they said that Indians had or natives had always been considered legitimate slaves in the colony of New Jersey. And as proof, they cited these laws that I referenced earlier that reference Negro, Indian, and mulatto slaves as a way of saying it was accepted practice throughout the colonial period to enslave natives. Um, so this entire case hinged in the fact that slavery laws had included the term Indian and therefore gave implicit legal status to Indian slavery. And eventually, of course, New York, New Jersey, uh, file or pass these gradual emancipation acts uh, following New England colonies and, and other uh, regional Atlantic colonies as well. 1799, New York, uh, 1804, New Jersey. New York doesn't abolish actual slavery until 1827. These gradual emancipation laws um, keep those who are enslaved in slavery, uh, but have uh, basically a, a prohibition against additional enslavement. So people were born who would otherwise be enslaved after these dates um, are no longer enslaved. But it leads to a very slow and painful ending of slavery in the North in different kinds of ways. Um, and just stepping back to taking the bigger picture for a moment, um, to think about how this all plays out of our time. You have these gradual emancipation acts, 
But westward colonization by the United States after the American Civil War, and especially after the Louisiana Purchase and the Mexican-American War, reignites this question of indigenous slavery and unfreedom in New Mexico, Utah, and California. And there's only a few scholars really working uh, on indigenous slavery in this region, but it's a fascinating field of research. Uh, because um, it, it, enslavement and, and sort of unfreedom takes on different kinds of form in terms of debt peonage and other sorts of forms that might not be equivalent with chattel slavery, but nonetheless, the functionality or the, the sort of way it ruled natives' lives was functionally equal. Um, so the transatlantic slave trade ends in 17, uh, 1807, 1808. And uh, the British colonies in the Caribbean, of course, outside of the United States, uh, which is no longer colonies at this point, um, slavery itself ends, but it takes the American Civil War and the 13th Amendment to end Black slavery, but notably does not actually extend to indigenous unfreedom. And so it takes a separate act by Congress in 1867 to outlaw the peonage and unfreedom of indigenous people in New Mexico and all other American colonies and territories. So there's, there's a, a long shadow of these kinds of um, trends of indigenous enslavements, of the effects on uh, Native American families. Um, and I could talk much more about that, but um, I know I've gone on long enough and hopefully at minimum, I've given a little bit of food for thought about how the history of indigenous enslavement might be sort of understood in these areas, but also within the larger context of the hemisphere of North America uh, and of the English colonies in particular. So um, I look forward to our conversation and uh, thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. A lot of new information. So the first question is, in New York, is there evidence of people from Ireland, Scotland, and Wales participating as enslavers? Um, and then there's a second question, how did, we, in that same box, how did women in New York support enslavement? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, really good questions. Um, so I'm just trying to think of, of direct examples where in the records, um, especially in the ones that I've looked at, which is largely sort of uh, newspaper and then sort of official colonial documentation evidence, um, where people's ethnicity are called out in quite the same way. Um, one of the examples of one of the runaway slave ads or self-emancipated ads that I remember seeing um, one indigenous person was the descendant of an African woman and an Irish man. Um, but that doesn't really uh, <laughs> answer the question necessarily. So I'm, I'm afraid my, I'm not really sure what to, how to answer that. Um, uh, but someone on this call might be able to answer that more precisely, perhaps. Um, women in New York, you know, I think, I don't know if there's anything different about New York necessarily than other places. Um, there's, there's a lot that could be said, uh, but there's, there's not a lot of evidence um, that women as a class, at least not in these earlier periods, were somehow uh, more anti-slavery than, than men. You do have, you know, maybe some exceptions, some examples, um, but women are gifted enslaved people um, who they hold for, for life at times. Um, they, uh, you know, benefit directly from the household labor of, of enslaved people. Um, and so um, there are, I think, more than sort of gender divides, and this is uh, more anecdotal than sort of a comprehensive study. I think you have um, cultural differences in terms of whether it's religious or um, other kinds of pockets of the population that feel differently about slavery. Um, more than saying, well, within Episcopalianism or something like that, you know, 95% of women were anti-slavery and 5% pro-slavery, but the men were like 50-50 or something like that, right? No, I think this is a culture, generally speaking, until you reach a, a different date, um, where, you know, slavery might be um, 
question in some ways, but certainly not challenged uh, legally and, and in household environments. Um, the evidence I've seen anyway, there's there's very little evidence that, that you would find that kind of a split. Um, but again, this is more anecdotal than comprehensive. Thank you. And uh, Dennis Micah is with us tonight, and he is asking, where did the West India Company prohibit indigenous enslavement in 1636 Brazil? Oh, you'd have to, now you're sending me back to my footnotes. Um, I'm going to have to get, have to get back to you on that, Dennis. Uh, it's a very, very good question. Um, it's buried in my book manuscript somewhere, so I don't have that to my tongue. Um, could I could I respond to that a little bit? I, I've just never Please. seen that. It just it's an interesting. I'd be yeah. curious, you know, to know more about that because right at 1636, the West India Company is is beginning its importation of of slaves into Brazil. Yeah. Um, they're not really doing much of anything in, in New Netherland. Um, they're talking about it, but they're not really doing much. And so that's why I'd be curious to, to see if they if they want to prohibit indigenous slaves because that they want to improve their market for the slaves that they're importing from Africa. So I'm. I was just really curious about that. Um, well, and so I what, think, what do you I mean, think? So I, it's a really good question. My own hunch, and again, this is, I'd have to go back and take a second look, my own hunch that it, there's a, a deep pragmatism to some of these prohibitions, right? Um, so that let's say that it is motivated uh, by not just Brazil, but I would sort of widen that maybe to activity, you know, on the Northern rim of South America more generally at the Caribbean or something. Um, there, there may well be specific instances that that um, cause this to be a proclamation, even though it's centered in one locale, that they sort of realize that this might be better policy more generally. Um, but that also might explain why it's not followed so much in New York, for example, if there's a, a, a different kind of a context that is actually prompting this. Um, but I, what I find about indigenous slavery more generally is it's it's really circumstantial when it benefits local officials and when it benefits the empire most of the time nobody has a problem with it um one example of this in the english empire is in 16 excuse me 1741 there's a, a prohibition against indigenous slavery um, in jamaica and when you start to dig deeper what you find is that it's it's emanating out of the, the mosquito shore the mosquito indians are slave raiding indigenous peoples that the English want to retain as allies uh, during war with Spain, essentially. Um, and so this law is passed saying no indigenous slavery. Why? Not because, you know, the empire thinks that like indigenous people should be free necessarily, but because it's disrupting relations with indigenous peoples. And so I think that's my hunch in this instance, but um, I appreciate the question and it's going to send me back to take a second <laughs> look at the, the context here. Right, we all have to memorize our footnotes, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, I wish. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Alice King uh, comments, I'm interested in how the examples of New York and New Jersey affect our understanding of the binary of freedom and slavery. So many of the stories you've told this evening, especially from the 17th century, are murky at the edges. In your wider projects, how have you wrestled with the spectrum of captivity mm -hmm. on display in the Americas without downplaying the severity and trauma of individual indigenous people's experiences? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic question. Uh, thank you so much. One of the things that I've been trying to wrestle with, with this book, which is fully drafted, but but not out yet, of course, um, is what do we, just that question, what do we learn about the nature of slavery writ large in the English empire? And I would say the Americas more generally by looking at the particularities of indigenous enslavements. Uh, and so in some cases, yes, there's a murkiness there. Um, that's partly because of the illegality or the sort of um, semi-legality of, of these kinds of practices in certain areas. If the English empire has a hard time making a pronouncement about African slavery for the entire empire, they don't do anything close to that for indigenous slavery. It's so localized. And yet when it causes an issue, like I just said, then you find these kinds of pronouncements. And so what I hope comes out of, of this and looking at indigenous slavery, I guess two things. First of all, I think it um, it does complicate the binary, but I don't think that that destabilizes the idea of enslavement or minimizes the trauma that it caused indigenous people. And here is maybe part two of the reason why. 
as I've been collaborating with, uh, with our tribal partners and so forth, one of the things that has been really impressed upon me is if we think about things from an, indig an indigenous perspective, um, the effect is the same no matter what. It might be called servitude, might be called slavery, it might be a forced indenture. All these are kind of technicalities that we as scholars or the colonizers have the benefit of parsing. But from the perspective of indigenous communities, it's a loss. It's a, it's a stealing. And that's why our project is called Stolen Relations, because um, it's actually not about labor, right, from an indigenous perspective, like it's about loss. And so one of the things that might help us is to think about what it means to have people who are here first experience slavery that leads to loss, that leads to community destabilization, that leads to land loss, that leads to kind of political kind of destabilization and ultimately a loss of sovereignty. Um, but in all of that, I don't want to at all take away from, you know, African slavery and, and, and uh, the effects of that on West Africa and African people both then and there, but also here and today. Um, there's historical trauma that's involved in, in both populations for sure. But I think there's something different about the way in which resident populations, when they're enslaved, when their uh, land is taken, um, that looks different. On the spectrum of, of slavery or spectrum of unfreedom question, I'm still wrestling with this too. I, I increasingly, I go through phases. Sometimes I, I like that phrase and I think that we should be nuanced. And other times I think that um, we're just kind of playing with words and, <laughs> and that we should just sort of uh, not believe the sources when they say, oh, this person was just a servant, right? Because we know that they're playing with language at times too and not being fully honest, just like the Bermuda example, a servant for 99 years, right? Um, so I, I guess depends what day you catch me on as to my answer to that. But thank you for the question. I really appreciate it. I, I did have a question um, when you talked about judicial enslavement. And I'm, a, I'm thinking that court ordered indenture could be done for just about anybody. So was it handled differently for indigenous people and also black people than it would be if a white person was being punished? They might be given like seven years and the other person might. So I just wondered if it was yeah. different. Yeah, I think that it's, it's a really good point. And one of the dangers of focusing only on one component of these things, whether it's indentures uh, or um, judicial enslavement or judicial sort of kinds of punishments in general, is to um, inadvertently communicate that there was something wholly unique. But I do think that there is something different that you see in the records. So there's one example I'm thinking of where an enslaved uh, Native American and a, a white servant were both caught committing the same crime, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the white servant got like two years of slavery and the other person gets uh, an indeterminate amount of slavery and disappears from the record entirely, right? And so even when the punishment is leveraged in somewhat similar ways, um, I think there's really sort of a, a deeply different way that they're being viewed by the courts, by magistrates, um, and far fewer recourses to other sort of apparatus that might help you out, like, you know, yeah, the courts or even like English common law or something that you might lean upon. Um, so, yes, other people were indentured, other people were, you know, court ordered to be this or that, were punished in different ways, but um, the slippage is always in sort of what happens after that sort of, you know, bill of indenture is signed or the punishment is meted out. And I think I find that really dangerous and fascinating uh, that there are these gaps in which people disappear in terms of the record. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and I see Dennis has his hand up again, but I just, before there's a very particular question here that I think you can answer pretty quickly. Uh, did the council of 12 men of New Amsterdam have any opposition to Keith's war on grounds of indigenous enslavement? Maybe that's not so easy to answer. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to think about what I've read in those um, in those records, and I, I I confess I can't think of anything specifically on that. Um, what I do know is that the 
I'm trying to, I'm, in Kiev's war was the same way, but there was, in both Kiev's and the Esopus wars, there were petitions by regional natives to free the captives. And so it does become a point of tension, um, whether that was an opposition to Kiev's war, precisely on that grounds, I don't know, but there uh, is a lingering sense of, again, this practical problem of, of really upsetting people that you're supposed to be trading with and allying with in some ways. And so you have two options, either you completely you know, subdue them and dominate them, or you try to make peace in some way. And indeed, in both instances, captives were given back as a way of placating, um, but some were also sold off as well. Okay, thank you. So Dennis, did you wanna? Think. Sure. Hi, Linford. Uh, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. I have, I have so many questions. You raised so many interesting points, and I really appreciate that. Um, but I'm struck by one thing in particular because I know that you agree that slavery as an institution, you know, evolved over time in yeah. in, in the entire Atlantic world that you're talking about. And and something that struck me in in one of the things that you said, we use the term captivity and enslavement, and mm -hmm. the term captivity just seems to you know, ring a bell for me because I think mm -hmm. when you look at the early days of slavery the, as an institution, um, especially in, um, in New Netherland in New York, mm -hmm. the purpose of captivity somehow influences the enslavement that mm -hmm. follows. So uh, for example, um, you're, you referred to kidnapping, that it's not necessarily taking place in New Netherland, but that's a great example of a captivity, but the kidnapping is for what purpose? Yeah. The enslavement of the first people that arrive in the Netherlands is indirect. It's privateers and they're purchased and mm -hmm. puts, the captivity has already been done. Mm -hmm. um, when slaves are, uh, enslaved Africans are captured in Africa and deliberately sold as labor, that's a different reason behind the captivity. When the natives, in, indigenous people are, are captive, you know, that's a war situation, especially in terms of what what Stuyvesant ultimately did, um, you know, later on the Asopus Wars, um, and then indigenous people also cap, uh, held cap, held white captives at the same time, you know, in, in the Indian Wars. Was that enslavement at the same time? So I'm wondering. I'm just. I don't know what to. What, where my question is, but I'm just. I'm, I'm intrigued by that idea about captivity being an essential component for helping to define what evolves over time. And I'm wondering if you thought about that a little bit, or, or you have some mm -hmm. comments about that. That's essentially my question. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the push to be more precise in terms of our language. And I think that, um, you know, there's a way in which the field is kind of wrestling with this. And one of the sources of this language of captivity comes from scholars of the African slave trade, who want to push back against this language, this categorical language as West Africans, as immediately slaves, right? And to try to sort of understand, of course, so, so we use the term enslavement as well as a way of thinking about the activeness, the sort of activity of enslaving people. But I think their argument is, is that they are captives. Uh, they're, they're captured by other, you know, kingdoms and tribes and stuff like that. And then they're still captives as they're taken across the Atlantic and they're not enslaved formally until they're sold as slaves. I think that's the rationale. Whether or not we agree with that entirely, I don't know, but I'm, I'm also intrigued by this idea that we don't fast forward to something uh, else until it actually happens, right? And I think that's part of your point here too, is, is that, um, you know, captivity, uh, you know, in, in the context of war, you're right, maybe sort of, you know, there's Abenaki captives that are brought down, you know, uh, in King William's War or something like that, or, or King George's War that are held in, in, or Queen Anne's War that are held in Boston. Um, and, and sometimes we know the fate of them. Sometimes they are sold uh, regionally, but sometimes they're used for captive exchanges as well. So I'm certainly not of the opinion that every time someone is taken, that leads to enslavement. And if I made, uh, gave that impression, I, I, I didn't mean to. But I think there's enough, there's so many times when it's uncertain as to what the outcome is, and it's uncertain as to what the experience was. And I think that's kind of what I think is intriguing too. So is there white slavery, you know, uh, in Barbados as sort of the subfield of the Irish descendants want to claim? Is there white slavery among indigenous peoples? Like was Anne Hutchinson a slave, right? Like, um, I don't really know fully. Um, 
but the the, the difference between um, I, I just think there's different layers of experience too. So without getting too much into sort of the white captivity among Native Americans, um, you know, you you probably have read this that so many times they had a hard time getting Indian children or white children back from indigenous communities, right? Because they sort of really enjoyed their lives and whatever else. And, and that sort of fundamental experience of yes, being in a different culture and everything else, but um, not also working on the plantation, I think makes me nervous about sort of like comparing these two things as well. But then again, if it's, you know, people being held against their freedom, then I think we're talking about parallel experiences at some level too. So Basically, I'm talking in circles, maybe with you to think about the complexity and difficulty of these things. I guess the final thing I'll say is I also am nervous about letting these early adventurers off too easily. Um, if they're kidnapping, capturing people on the coast and on the waterways and, and so forth, there's, as I argue in this one chapter, there's a, a different kind of colonization taking place in a way. It's a colonizing of the mind or of information or of, of knowledge in a way. Um, so is that slavery? I mean, probably not if they, you know, had some sort of bodily autonomy, but I, I think we need to talk about this different than just like, oh, you know, they, they kind of temporarily kidnapped them. I, that feels wrong too. So there's a, there's a settler colonial violence being done that I think our language doesn't always capture if that makes sense. So but terrific question. I really appreciate that push. And clearly I'm still thinking about this too. So I appreciate that. Thank you both. It's a big subject. Um, Jan Trachtman said during then French and Indian wars were captured Indians given to soldiers as slaves during the French and Indian wars. I'm trying to think of this of specific examples. Um, more frequently, uh, indigenous people, um, allies wanted to to retain captives, um, and more frequently too in these kinds of wars, land was promised as a result. This this became sort of the default uh, motivation in a way of recruitment is is land. Um, I'm trying to think of specific examples in the French and Indian War, and I, I, I don't know. I do know that in a lot of other wars, um, this was one of the promise uh, of, of potentially captives if you sign up. Um, a, a good question that unfortunately I can't answer on the spot. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else have a question or a comment that they would like to raise as we approach the end? Um, I, I just want to say with this, this program and the other ones that came before it, it really does open up so much. And I appreciate your, your last discussion with Dennis, because it's a lot to think about not lessening anybody's trauma and the experience that they went through. And the, I, I want to say evil, because that's what it was that people had, but also to try to understand how did this whole, this is may not be where you're going, but the, how did this whole institution come to be with all of these mm -hmm. rules and regulations that people then accepted as being true? And I, I think it's fascinating. I'm very grateful that we've been able to go back to the 1600s and see when um, you know, it wasn't regulated, when there weren't rules because everything was just beginning anew and the choices people made towards violence and then trying to figure out what what the rules were once they made those decisions. And, you know, there were, there were examples Dennis and Andrea spoke about of um, black of African enslaved persons who sued for their, their freedom because no one told them they couldn't. And they, a lot of them won because the, the rules weren't there. <laughs> and then once people figured out what was going on, they put the rules in. I mean, it's, it's sad and also it's interesting. So, um, David, did you uh, want to speak before we close? Um, the only the only comment I have, only because this is a, a totally new topic to me, is that by circumstance today and going through our documents, 
we discovered Indian slaves within the Leisler family. And I had never, ever noticed these documents before. So uh, other than the fact that uh, I, we came upon these documents today, uh, I can have no comment because I've not thoroughly studied them. But if you're interested, I will forward that information to you. Um, it's, add a whole, it's added a whole new element in uh, what I've been thinking. That's that's amazing. I'm 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 astonished. Um, I mean, I'm not surprised at the one uh, at some level, and and I'm also intrigued by that. If you have references or scans or something, uh, I'd be really interested to see. Oh, know. definitely, I can send you that. The only, the other comment, of course, is that uh, slavery in the other way, um, of course, lies as uh, captivity by the Barbary pirates and. Uh, with his family and uh, the redemption process that went on and the whole slave trade that went on in the North African world of Europeans. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that uh, needs to be considered as well when we're talking about this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and in a way, that's why I started with that Mediterranean uh, kind of phase of things, which which didn't all of a sudden disappear, as you say. I mean, the 17th century is sort of the peak of this. There's, you know, all these publications, these narratives of um, Ottoman enslavement and so forth that I think is is super fascinating and gets back to Dennis's question, I guess, in a way of, uh, and somebody else had this a similar question, how do we compare these different kinds of, of captivities and enslavements? And you know, the one thing that I think that comes out of the African slave trade and the sort of African slavery literatures trying to think about uh, the racialization of such experiences, right? And so does it, does it mean something different when you sort of systematically target a certain group of people as the only people who can be enslaved in certain ways? And I would argue that's the case for, for the colonies, especially um, no white person is subjected to permanent multiple generation slavery from what I can tell. That's reserved for people of color. That's Africans and Indians, right? And it might operate slightly different in the Mediterranean, but my sense is there's probably sort of differentiation between those kinds of um, strictures as well. Thanks for having me. It was really nice to see everyone on Zoom. Sorry if I went too long. Uh, thanks for the great questions. It really pushed me in, in good ways. So um, thank you so much for being here and for taking time to, to listen and to engage. And thank you so much. I really appreciate this was a great talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone who came. Thank you. Take care, everyone.